Thank you. So um, what I'd like to do today, the, the subject is uh, the collaborative cloud. Now, we've heard a, we've heard a lot about cloud today. Um, and we've been speaking, I think, at Cloud Circle quite a lot over the uh, last um, year, year and a half. So one thing that would be interesting for me is just to know who's been to a Cloud Circle event before. Who's been to a Cloud Circle event in 2011 before? OK, so about half and half. So let me just summarize what we've spoken about, um, myself or my colleagues, over 2011. We've talked about our vision for cloud. We have this idea of a 100% web. Um, and as part of that, we're talking about the applications. Um, so those who've been here before will have heard a lot about those. We've talked about the platform itself, um, what Google's doing to unbundle its massive scaled infrastructure to make available some of the uh, tools, assets um, that we build on to the enterprise situation. Um, and the real big thing, I think, this year, uh, with the growth of tablets, the growth of mobile, um, iPhone, Android, iPads, the devices, Chromebook um, has been a, a, something with growing interest. What does it mean, really, to move to 100% web? And my colleagues have got some you can play with later if you're interested. But I want to ask a, a more fundamental question. I'm going to talk a lot about fundamentals today. Um, so what? So what? It's all great. It's great technology. Now, if I step back and I tell you a little bit about my role, my role um, is to work with enterprise solutions. And a lot of what I'm interested in is the impact that we're making on the people who are using our tools or using these cloud solutions. Um, we did, um, over the last six months, a significant amount of research with our customers, customers that we've been working with or three or four years in some cases. Um, and we were looking to try and identify the drivers of value for them in the use of the cloud. So the cloud's a technology, but where's the value coming from? And in those surveys, we were able to identify, uh, so there were surveys of interviews of benchmark research. There's three things we're looking for, really, to have a qualified value driver. Um, we want to know that they're um, publicly referenceable, there's hard numbers associated with them, and fundamentally they're also benchmarked by third party research. So we came up with a number of these, and what's interesting is how the value drivers fall into these five main areas. These are the categories that we identify, collaboration, innovation, merger and acquisition is an interesting one, uh, and one I'll come back to. Mobility, the big thing this year. And of course, IT cost reduction, um, something that people have been aware of for some time. 40% of the value drivers, 50% of the value drivers are in innovation. Collaboration and innovation, 50% in total. So when you look at how they fall, what you find is only 20% of the value drivers people are experiencing are coming out of reduced TCO or environmental factors. And it started me thinking, really, is where's the benefit lying? How is this coming together? This, this one, particularly, is mergers and acquisitions. It seems such a specific area. But there's something happening in mergers and acquisitions. Sure, it's a very big IT project. You're bringing two lots of systems. You're needing to put them together. But there's something bigger going on, which is the fact that there's a huge amount of change and transformation within those businesses. And what you start seeing is, where the value is coming from is more than just simple IT. So I've sort of categorized really this transformation into three types. The first type of transformation is one that we've spoken about quite a lot, the technology. You know, how, do, how we move the data across, the migration, the integration, all those really important questions we have to answer. And often in that area, we're looking for benefits like lower total cost of ownership, moving the CapEx, OpEx um, boundary, we're talking about whether we want to moving into upgrade, just a simple upgrade of the feature functions. The next level is the business. How are we changing the way the business works? Well, who's interested in this? What does it mean in terms of productivity? What does it mean when we start introducing mobility into a business? This is another level of transformation to, to think about. And the final level, if 
probably the one that's hardest to put the hard numbers on in a sense. But the final level is what it's doing to the culture, i.e. the way people work. And there are impacts and benefits at all of these levels. So I'm going to dig down into each of these. The first one I'm going to talk about is the, the technology transformation. This is a, a very interesting um, report by BCG um, came out in the last, uh, last year. Um, and what they were looking at is saying, well, actually, we can see across the board 10 to 30% savings in TCO. These are messages, things you've seen before. There have been a lot of analyst reports along this. Uh, Vallejo and the city of Los Angeles were, were two of the Google customers that participated in, in the research we did. Underneath all that, the dynamic is fairly simple. You're changing the boundary between how much effort you're spending in-house on run costs, you know, patching servers, setting them up. You're starting to move that out. If you can change that around, I think it was Gartner said, 80% um, of the money that we put into IT goes into keeping the lights on. What happens if we can change that around so that it's 80% of the investment in IT is actually doing something which makes a difference to the business? Um, and this is, a, this is really the, the basis of outsourcing, which has been going for 20, 20, 25 years. Can we achieve that? Um, so you're seeing some of the drivers here, end user costs, you know, downtime training, etc. Administration, do you need to administer those servers yourself? Can someone else do it? Operations, hardware, software, etc., etc. Now, I wanted to pick out, I'm going to show you some things from the research. These are some of the statements that some of our customers have said. And Rentakill was saying, reckon they saved 70% of what they would have spent to go on as an on-premise solution by, by moving to the cloud. Um, Jaguar Land Rover, public statement, about several million pounds. Hunter Douglas, return on investment in just over one year. So there's a case to be made here. Um, and I think this is the... The big debate, really, between on-premise and cloud is in this space at the technology level. So next thing I'd like to talk about is the business transformation. And again, look at what the analysts are saying. This is a, a McKinsey report um, on uh, uh, the networked enterprise. I'll be sharing these slides later. I realize that some of the text and references are small, so uh, you'll be able to find them, click on them. Um, and interestingly enough, what they're talking about is where the cloud is impacting in the business space, in the operation of the business. So reducing operational costs, travel costs, uh, increasing employee satisfaction, which is a, an interesting one that comes up um, quite a lot. So of these, though, I would say probably the biggest factor is, has been the driving of mobile. Um, this is a, these graphs from an Aberdeen report, you don't need the detail, but what they're showing is a huge growth in mobile, both tablets and phones and the intention to grow across all categories, actually, all, all brands. Um, and the, the, this is kind of really shaping and changing the way on the floor what people are doing and how they're doing them. Because the device form factor, as we've been speaking about already today, is, is offering new ways of doing the processes we do, more productive ways of doing the processes um, that we have to run our businesses on. And when you look at this, um, this is the benefits that are coming from mobile. These are the sort of things people are seeing and putting in their business cases. What does it mean to sales? What does it mean to operations? What does it mean to people on the shop floor? Or people out in the field doing home visits? Um, and every business has their own ways of looking at this. But the impact on those processes is critical to understand. The opportunity is critical to understand. Um, and similarly, when you look... Interesting, this selection came more from the hospitality and retail sectors, um, particularly in that field-facing operation. What, are we, what does it mean to the front of house and the hotels? This is user productivity increasing by 10% for those Delta hotels. Um, Eat, a more recent one, real big thing for them is allowing people to get away from their desks in front of customers. Um, obviously critical to those businesses. Now, I think the final one, and for me, the most interesting one, is the impact it has on culture. Um, it's a lot less tangible in some respects to talk about. But I don't know if anyone picked up the um, Harvard Business Review for this quarter. They had a big feature on collaboration and what it means from a cultural perspective. And if anyone's really interested in this area, I would definitely uh, recommend picking up some of these papers and reading them. 
But they're starting to pick up on some of the real drivers of change, those, the big ones, the, the, the big things that we need to look at. The change in the way we're working in teams, for example, global, virtual. Um, you know, the board doesn't need to meet in a specific room in a specific office. Um, how many people these days are doing teleconferences at 7 o'clock at night with the US or early in the morning with uh, India? Um, and this is the way things work. Yeah, a lot of hands go up, go up there. Um, and, of course, what we're seeing in terms of the, 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 the change in operating norms, norms, this is complexity, um, cultural values, these become very important, not just in managing global teams, but in the way you're going to work together as people in that organization. Um, so I want to just take a step back and actually pick up on a theme that um, uh, the previous speaker was, was speaking about, was looking at the, the way technology has evolved in the workplace. Um, this is a framework that um, was drawn out to some extent by uh, Crackhart and Hansen, a seminal paper, um, b b the company behind the chart. And what, what they were talking about was every organization has three types of power structure, if you like. The org chart representing the bureaucracy, the bureaucratic power structure. And when computing comes into the enterprise, uh, post-war, it's coming in in a very bureaucratic way. The mainframe, it's in the basement, you have to go down, sign, uh, sign papers to get access to it. It's a very powerful resource. And there's differentiation in the business through access to that power at a corporate level. Now, as Moore's law expands and the microchip, uh, microprocessor really comes into its own, we see the rise of, of the desktop paradigm um, 80s, um, in the 80s. And what we see there is the enablement of one of Crackhart and Hansen's second networks of power. And they call that the expert network, the individual specialist how they're working with knowledge within the business. And you see a, a wholesale change in the organization because of the PC and the way information is hoarded or shared or not. Um, and this informal advice network is obviously very, very important. It's the question is, who's powerful in that network? Ask yourself, who do I go to for advice on a particular topic or subject? Who is it that really knows? Um, they may not be the most popular people, but... Um, what you see there is the rise of sort of individual productivity. Um, the third network that was identified was the trust network or the social network. So in your organization, think, who is it you confide in? Who is it you trust? Who is it you talk about when you've got problems? You know, what, what sort of conversations are you having over the coffee machine and with whom? So you can get people who are very important in this network who aren't necessarily high in the bureaucracy in the org chart, and they're not necessarily an expert in their subject, but they can make huge differences within the organization. And um, it's, it's a very diffuse network, to use that phrase. Um, and this, what we're talking about here is when you're starting to get these networks working, you're talking about the way teams work. Uh, I think this is an insight that, um, you know, at Google, we discovered um, probably about seven or eight years ago that the unit of productivity is the team. Uh, someone asked me the other day, why did Google go into you know, rewriting its office tools? Why do that? You know, we've got search, we've got advertising, all these other things. And I was talking to um, a guy called Jonathan Rochelle who, who runs that whole unit. He's a lead product manager. He was actually acquired when they bought the spreadsheet or the, the foundations of it. And part of the rationale behind it was that the tools we had weren't serving the way we wanted to work because the tools of a, uh, that came, very powerful tools that came out of an era of individual productivity. And what we wanted to do is work as teams, global teams, so that we can work together whether we're in, in Mountain View in, on, on the West Coast or in uh, Denmark or in India. Wherever we are, we should be able to work together. Talent is not all focused in, in Silicon Valley. You know, talent is global. Uh, the emerging markets particularly, the amount of talent that's coming out of there is, is, is staggering. So there's a key sort of correlation is this ability to collaborate and the ability to innovate. This is a, a study done by um, the, um, the, the Future Foundation last year. And they did a study looking at the correlation between innovation and collaboration. 
Um, if you want to move fast, if you want to get those ideas to market in the shortest time, collaboration is how you do it. The productive team. So, changing culture. You know, when you look at, again, some of the public customer statements, you know, Google Apps has changed the way we work. That's a cultural statement. A statement of cultural change. Um, it's constantly evolving our users' working experiences. Manufacturing. Um, ensuring the continuing development of a culture of change. This is this point again. Continual <coughs> development. Looking to make sure that what we're doing today continues to move forward. Um, and that's a cultural attitude within an organization. So, to summarize, I'd like to just come back to this picture and ask this question, is who is interested? Who, to whom do these benefits accrue and who's interested in the benefits that can come? At the technology level, you know, the sort of the idea of the IT manager driven, uh, maybe measured on reduction of cost, driving efficiencies out of the IT organization. There are benefits there. You need to be aware of them. You need to be able to model them out. Second is, who are the business executives? What business processes are you going to affect? What does mobility mean within the organization? You know, how can you make those processes more effective? And then finally, ask yourself, who's the visionary leader within the organization who cares about the culture and the impact on the culture that some of these tools can have, the social, the collaborative tools? And at each of these levels, there are benefits. Some of them are a lot easier to put hard numbers on, particularly at the business and maybe at the technology. The cultural is a different sort of conversation. But it's one you need to be aware of because you need to find out who these people are. Now, the visionary leader, it can be the CIO. We've seen it num numerous times. A number of them have, have spoken on this stage. In some cases, it's not. The CIO is very business orientated. But then who's going to care about that cultural change? Find them and find out what they're looking for and what they're trying to achieve. Um, so, I just wanted to bring it clo to a close, this idea of the collaborative cloud. The emphasis is not on cloud, it's on collaboration. And I, I pose this question in, in a sense, is the, in a sense, the cloud without collaboration is just a newer way of doing the same old things. If you, if you only think about it in a technology level, there are, there's a huge amount of missed opportunity. So if there's anything I'd like to leave is just that thought. Find out, understand, and identify the opportunity at all levels of the organization. Um, so that's it. Thank you very much.